The Unshackled Waves, episode 255. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. During the federal election campaign, we provided extensive coverage of the campaign of Fraser Anning's Conservative National Party. It was only registered in April this year, but managed to stand 70 candidates, including in 29 of the 30 lower house seats in Fraser Anning's home state of Queensland. Fraser Anning failed to gain re-election to the Senate, with the party only obtaining a 0.64% of the Senate vote nationally. This was despite Fraser Anning's Facebook page gaining over 120,000 followers and generating large amounts of publicity, both positive and negative. So after a whirlwind start to the year, but an underwhelming election result, where to from here from the party? That is the topic of discussion today with my guest, Paul Taylor, who was the number two Queensland Senate candidate for the Conservative Nationals. Originally born in India after migrating to Australia in 1985, he has built a successful business career. He previously ran as a Rise Up Australia Party candidate in 2016. Paul believes that the biggest threat facing Australia and the West is Islam. So there is a lot to discuss with him today. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, your first entry into politics was with the Rise Up Australia Party as their lead uh, Queensland Senate candidate in 2016. Uh, now, why did you decide to uh, get involved in politics at that time and what was that experience like? My first entry into politics really was with the LNP when I nominated for the seat of Rankin. And there were quite a few members of parliament who were supporting me for that seat. And they were, they were very careful in what they had to say to me and advising me to, to be very careful of what I had to say about Islam. And their advice to me was very clear. They said, you've got the credentials, you've got the experience, you've got the knowledge, and you'll make an excellent federal member of parliament. But just try and tone down your opinions on Islam. So when I went to my interview with the LNP, and I had to give them access to my Facebook page, and one of the one of the comments I made out there was in reference to the then President of the United States, and I actually typed his whole name up, and I said Barack Hussein Obama. And so they asked me at this interview, why did you actually put his name Hussein Obama? I said, well, because that is his name. I said, are you offended by it? <laughs> And they went through a few other things, and I, I soon came to the stage and I said, I said, I think I'm wasting my time with you guys. Their response to me was very clear. They said, you know, you've got a lot to offer us, and we'd love to have you at the party. But I will mention the guy's name. His exact words to me were, he says, he says son, we, we'd love to have you in Parliament. You tick all the boxes for us, particularly your, your, your corporate background skills with business. But we've just got to be careful on this subject. My response was, well, I'm happy. If you're content to sell the country out, then I'm happy to move somewhere else. So given that you know that Islam is a dangerous ideology. And so I quit from them and resigned on the spot. And as I get emails from, all, from friends all over the place, an email came in from, from Rise Up Australia. This, it was a forward to me and I read it. It's the first time in my life I heard of Danny and Alaya. So I read the whole email and I agreed with everything in there. I promptly rang the guy, had a conversation with him, and he said, I'm coming up to Brisbane in a couple of weeks and I'd love to meet you. So we caught up, had a long chat, a very long, productive meeting, and I wasn't ready to join them and stand as a candidate at the time. This continued on with them, and it was the, uh, the following election that it came about, and they asked me to stand as the lead Senate candidate for them in Queensland. It was an excellent experience. I went around the state, to many engagements, speaking engagements. And at the launch of the party for the election in, 20, in 2016, or yeah, 2016, then my speech is on YouTube. And I spoke for about 24 minutes, I think. And I generally talk without notes. It just comes straight off the cuff for me. And that speech went very well. And I was quite impressed with the invitations I received across the state to come along and speak at various events. And when I compare the crowds that we got at, at the events I spoke at and what some other Patriot leaders got, I was quite impressed and 
quite chuffed and I was I was expecting a better result and unfortunately that did not happen but it was an excellent learning experience for me and what draws what draws me to it is I mean, I'm very concerned about Islam the the danger it poses to the country the evidence of this ideology across the Western world is overwhelming one would have to be in denial or be impeccably stupid or foolish not to acknowledge what it's doing to the West particularly in Europe I mean the evidence is overwhelming and as a migrant to this great country I grew up with with Islam around me in school and as neighbors I know how dangerous it is everywhere around the world wherever it goes the the outcome is exactly the same it's no different what's happening in Europe is no different to what's happening in in the the, the major so-called European towns in India suffocating under the influence and the the ex population explosion of Islam it's exactly the same everywhere around the world now this country was very gracious and kind in letting me come in here as a migrant I want to protect what this great country's got and unfortunately and I'm going to say it exactly the way it is now when I've spoken at many Patriot events say unfortunately the white man of this country is too afraid to stand up and speak to protect his own country I just can't get over that you know, I asked to come into this country you let me in I want to protect it I don't want it to go the way it is where I've come from what does it take for people to get it yeah that's definitely the right migrant attitude we want migrants here who come here and they, they want to well, this is the reason I came to embrace your your culture and, and way of life, not bring uh, what I left behind. Absolutely. You may have heard in some of my speeches, people, the, the country does not go out very rarely. I am aware that there are cases where the immigration department invites people to migrate here, people who've got sound business acumen, who've got manufacturing plants overseas. You know, the country invites them to come in here to set up business with incentives to develop and you know to be an employer of people in this country I can understand that but when people when most people ask to come here and some people beg and swindle their way in this country into this country and then they find our ways of life what we take for granted our Judeo Christian laws and things like that they find it offensive I mean why come here your experience in the the LNP, uh, sadly, you're probably not the only candidate who's come to that end. Because in the the 2019 federal election, we saw two uh, liberal candidates uh, disendorsed because of their views on Islam. And uh, the party that you're with, uh, Rise Up Australia, that's preferenced uh, last by the the Liberal Party, at least in my home state of Victoria. So they seem to be even though they talk about being tough on immigration, wanting the right people here, they, they don't want to be critical of Islam at all. I can't get it. Now, I had a meeting just before the last federal election with a very senior LNP member of parliament. I'm talking very, very senior in parliament with the LNP. And we were having a, a conversation and I quoted a few passages of the Quran to him and he said yes I'm very familiar with them and a few others as well I said so what does it take for you guys to actually come out and take a stand I said, because if you if you did that I said, you would literally wipe out the Patriot parties and his response was well it's decision made at higher levels mm. yeah they are, uh, I don't know why they can't learn from Trump and I, and I went on to say to him, I said, if you want to know when Donald Trump won the election, he won it on the 14th of December 2015. In Australia, it was the 15th of December 2015 when he made a statement. At that time, he, was, he wasn't even the nominee. He was just candidate Trump. And he made the statement, we've got to stop Muslim immigration until we work out what the heck is going on here. Yeah, that's when I took his candidacy seriously. When he, that was after the, the San Bernardino uh, terror shooting. And the moment he made that statement on my Facebook page, I posted, I said, he has won the election. And then we know the result. And I told this guy that, I said, that's all he takes. I said, the evidence is before you. All the country is looking for is for leadership. 
someone who's got the courage to not talk about it in his home, but to come out and stand before a microphone and actually advocate it. I don't know what it takes for these guys to get it. Yeah, they just... They're, uh... They're very cowardly when it comes to, to Islam, and sadly, it seems that every uh, election cycle, it's, it's just got worse. Now, now as you said, uh, when you ran for Rise Up in 2016, you were quite impressed with the, the crowds, but it wasn't reflected in the, the overall uh, vote. And uh, there were also other uh, patriot parties in that election, such as the Australian Liberty Alliance, but it seemed that... Uh, all of the nationalists and patriot voters, they ended up going back to the the lady that they knew best, which was Pauline Hanson. She uh, got re-elected to, to Parliament along with, with Malcolm Roberts. Uh, but of course, uh, Malcolm Roberts got caught up with the, the dual citizenship saga. And so uh, Fraser Anning took his seat in November uh, 2017. But it wasn't until his maiden speech in August uh, 2018, which uh, really, well, it did upset all of the uh, uh, the major parties. Now, I mentioned that uh, Pauline uh, returned. First of all, what was your opinion on that? And then did that change when, when Fraser Anning came along? When Fraser came along, it, there are a lot of disenchanted people in one nation. Now, Pauline has always been very, from the time I joined the party, she has always been very generous, very kind to me, very respectful to me. On a personal level, I've got nothing against her. And th that's where it is with me and, and Pauline. I was one of the very few candidates to have that had her personal mobile number and her personal email address, and I communicated directly with her. So when people would often talk even about her chief of staff, uh, all I would do is only listen, and my response could only be the truth. And that is, see, I never ever had any difficulties with, with James Ashby. I never had any challenges with Pauline. My relationship was always with Pauline, and it was one of respect, and uh, it, was a, it was a great relationship. The only reason I had to leave the party was when they took on a Muslim candidate, because that then silenced me, and basically was said to me, well, you know, it was a way of saying, well, Islam's not all that bad. Well, you can't be half pregnant. And I grew up with Islam around me. I know the danger of it. And I'm also conscious of a fundamental doctrine of Islam called Takiyah. So with, when Fraser came on the scene, I only joined Fraser after Pauline took in the Muslim candidate. But while he was doing what he was doing, it was totally irrelevant to me. And I did not even take notice of it. Again, when I joined Fraser, it was an email, uh, a post that came on Facebook that came through into my feed. And I listened to what he had to say. And I said, well, this guy's talking, you know, he's talking common sense. And I listened to him and then I, I, I researched his voting record in Parliament. And his voting record was very sound. It was highly credible. You know, Fraser said he was against abortion. He voted against, he voted against it. If he was against same-sex marriage, he voted against it. And unfortunately, on that occasion, Pauline abstained. But Fraser stood his ground and voted against it. So when I looked at his voting pattern, it began to say something to me about the character of the man. And then when this, when One Nation took the Muslim candidate, that then sealed it for me. And I SMS Pauline and I said, I thanked her for my time at the party and said to her that I was leaving the party. And I was joining Fraser as his number two on the Senate ticket. And I went on to say to her, we have a common foe, it's Islam, Labour and the Greens. So One Nation is not an enemy to us, and they are not an enemy party. Much the same as ALA, which has now changed their name to Yellow Shirts, I think. Yellow Vest Australia. Yellow Vest, something like that, yeah. So, you know, these people, they are not an opposition party to us. We've got, we've got a lot more in common than what keeps us apart, but it's just, I just wish these guys could get it together that we, as to who the real enemy is, and focus on the enemy, the danger to the country, and come together. Uh, Emma Eros, who was the, the Muslim One Nation candidate, she ran in the, the New South Wales state election. She was chosen by Mark Latham, who uh, became uh, the One Nation uh, MLC. He was the lead candidate in that election. And a lot of people believe that Pauline pretty much let Mark run 
New South Wales, and not only did he uh, chose to run M. Eros, but he actually managed to change uh, One Nation policy, so it no longer supports a Muslim immigration ban. Absolutely yeah, correct. Yes, I'm familiar with all of it. Yes. So One Nation is lo no longer, in, in my opinion, they can no longer claim to be, uh, be an authentic Patriot Party. And that's why I often post on our page, you know, we are now the only authentic Patriot Party in the nation. Now, Rise Up did tell me that they were deregistering, but I'm not too sure if that has actually happened. Yes, it has. It has happened? Okay. Yep. So that basically leaves us, and I don't know where Yellow Vest stand. I'm having uh, conversations with other smaller Patriot Parties and trying to pull them together. And letting them, letting them know, you know, all it takes for us to come together is for people to leave their egos behind. Now, you may or may not know of this. Going back in the 70s, the, the Nehru family almost owned India. The way they governed from, you know, election after election. For decades, they governed the country. And anybody who opposed the Nehru family, the leadership of the party, was kicked out of the party. And most of the people who were kicked out were people who were highly intelligent and highly capable and competent people. And these guys went off on their own and started their own little party. So what you in essence had was all these little cock sparrows standing around, leaders of their own party in this great democracy of India. And they never ever came to power because the Nehru family was so powerful and so big in the Congress party. But it took one guy who had the stature and the character to pull all of these people together and said, listen guys, if we don't come together, given we've got so much in common, we will never rescue this nation from this family. That's exactly what they did. They called themselves the Janata Party. They came together. At the next federal election in India, they didn't just become a major opposition. They won government. And I put that analogy when I spoke at various patriot events. I said, if the Indians can do it, where from the north, south, east, to west of India, you're talking literally people who talk a different language. It's actually a different culture. The people from the north to the south are a different culture. They can't talk the same language. The food they eat is different. The language they speak is different. The costumes, the way is different. If they can do it in India, why can't we in Australia do it? Why can't we come together, leave our egos outside, pull together and unify? to strengthen and rescue this nation from the advance of the most evil ideology humanity has ever known. It's always been uh, hypothesized in Australian politics that uh, a third party could emerge in the 90s. People thought that it was going to be One Nation in its first incarnation in 2013. They thought it was going to be uh, Clive Palmer. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, egos get in the way a lot of the time finding quality candidates and also money as well. You need lots and lots of money to run in Australian elections. Well, One Nation did have a spectacular opportunity in the 2016 election when they had four senators. The last Queensland state election, we were tipped to win something like 10 seats. And this is where I often, I, I'm relaxed to reference Pauline as being very generous to me. Uh, Kapalaba was a is a, was a very winnable seat for us and her exact words to me were I want you in Parliament and I'll find a winnable seat for you and she came back to me and said Kapalabar is a seat for you and I was put into the seat of Kapalabar but unfortunately uh, things happened closer to the election and we didn't uh, we were not all that successful now I know what happened but I'd, I'd rather just let it go through to the keeper well, they did get one candidate election elected, which is, is still is still a gain, but yeah, it was it was definitely uh, under underwhelming. Well, we stood something like I think uh, sixty candidates, and we came out with one. How many did Cater stand? Got three candidates. Yeah, well, he sort of just focuses on North Central Queensland. He's focusing on a very small area, pulling all his his resources there. If we had focused on whom the enemy was, and the enemy is Labour and the Greens, as a patriot, I'm, a, I'm very comfortable declaring it unashamedly. The enemy is Labour and the Greens to this nation. If we had just stood candidates in Labour seats and done a deal with the Conservatives, with the LNP, 
a good constructive deal with it, with the Conservatives. We would have had a good Conservative government in the state. I don't think Tim Nichols was the best leader for the LNP, but definitely better than the alternative. Mm. So we could have had a Conservative government. More than likely, we would have had quite a few One Nation candidates in Parliament. We would not have had these these sickening laws of safe schools that have been thrown out lock, stock and barrel. Late term abortion would have been thrown out the window. And all of these great, all of these disgusting policies would never have been in Parliament if we had just done it correctly. And I wonder if they've worked it out. Now, as we've established, you uh, left One Nation over there, that change in, in policy to, to Islam. That's when you switched to uh, Fraser Anning's party. Now, his maiden speech, which was in August 2018, it was interpreted by many as uh, lamenting the demise of the, the White Australia policy. Now, if that policy was still in place today, you wouldn't have been able to migrate to Australia. So how do you reconcile well, that interpretation of Fraser Anning's views with your support of his agenda? What Fraser Anning said there, the, the, the two words he said was the final solution was previously used in Parliament by 15 other parliamentary leaders. It's not the first time it was ever used. And that was not the context in which he used it. The context in which he used it was, you know, we need to draw a line in the sand. He could have just stopped and said, okay, we need to draw a line in the sand on this issue. People have taken it out of context because they, the speech was a powerful speech. It resonated very powerfully across the country. And so they had an opportunity. They seized on just two words. But if you look, Brendan Nelson, I understand, had used it in Parliament as well, a final solution. I think it's on the time of health, he used the same thing, the final solution. So many others have used it. They didn't jump on it at the time, but because he said it in reference to Islam, they saw it as an opportunity to jump on it. So there was no way in any way, shape or form directed in, ref in lamenting the demise of the White Australia policy. If that were the case, why would he have taken me and welcomed me as his number two Senate, Senate candidate? I mean, it flies in the face of everything the media have accused him of. And when I joined him, he... He did not at any stage, he just, he just promptly said, mate, I'm delighted to have you as my running mate. And the time that I've known him, I've not seen that from him, I've not heard it from him. Uh, the things, he, anything he has said, which has been on public record, is exactly what he said in private. Now, I totally agree with him with what's going on with the African gangs in, in, in Melbourne. It's not about the colour of the guy's skin. It's about these people who just cannot assimilate. You know, I've spoken on this, there's a video out there on on the net at the moment, where in 19, 1998, the government was warned, and it's recorded in Hansard, the government was warned that in moving the, the immigration policy from one of assimilation to multiculturalism, we would end up with the disaster we have on our hands. They were warned about it, but they ignored it. And I'm talking now about the Howard government was warned about it. Accusations that uh, Fraser Anning was a white nationalist, they persisted uh, throughout the uh, election cycle, and uh, this included uh, media exposés on his staff's alleged connections to white nationalist uh, groups. Uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, you had a good relationship with Fraser. He, uh, he was happy to have you as uh, your number two. Uh, was there any... Like any at any stage during the the pre-selection process was did your race or immigrant background ever come up as an issue? Never ever did. My pre-selection was very clinical. Some people who know me very well, and who happen to know Fraser very well, and we discussed it and said we discussed it and it came up that if I had joined Fraser, it would put an end to this false narrative that he is a white supremacist. But when I joined him, that certainly did, because they stopped that all. They stopped that immediately. And, and the number of press conferences that took place with me beside him, they never went near that ever again. Now, the people in the, the, the guys who you talk about, I did have a conversation the very first time I ever met him, who was then his chief of staff. And I did say to him, now, this has been brought to my attention. How accurate is this? And he gave me the whole inside running on it. And if I'm to take him at his word, then I can understand the the political culture that was around at the time and anybody who was associated with Fraser was being tarnished in 
whose, whose reputation was literally being slandered under the banner of parliamentary privilege. I did say to him, I said, I want you to put in writing to me a statement to refute these things because I have contacts in the media and I'll get this out and then we'll challenge people on it. And unfortunately, that, that did not come about because we were under so much of time pressure. As you know, the party was registered only 10 days before the election was called. Time had just beaten us. It probably wouldn't have helped that it seemed the entire mainstream media was uh, against Fraser Anning, especially after uh, the Christchurch uh, massacre. His uh, statement of that was uh, condemned. It seemed that everyone was, was cheering on uh, egg boy Will Conley, uh, just slap, slapping an egg on his head. Uh, unprovoked it, and the the liberal party decided to put and the national party as well put fraser and candidates last in in every seat uh, uh dead last so it was a very hostile uh, political and media environment you faced that is accurate but note how we responded to the conservative party to the liberal party even though they put us behind labor we still put them well ahead of Labour. We preference them two or three right across the nation because as far as we're concerned we are still conservatives. They're conservatives and we want to make sure that we do the right thing. See, they will account for their behaviour, we will account for our behaviour. And lo Notice the duplicity here. When Fraser was smacked on the head by Egg Boy, nothing came of it. When someone threatened to do something to Scott Morrison, that person was charged. Why have we got a two? Why have we got a two-tier system here of justice? Yes, uh, Egg Girl. Uh, she's uh, currently bef before the courts, and uh, for me, it's. I can't believe the the politicians and the media uh, didn't realize at the time that if you cheered on the egging of an elected politician, it was going to happen again, and it took for the attempted egging because the egg didn't crack on on scott morrison for them to or maybe we we shouldn't have encouraged that uh, sarah hansen young she referred to egg boy as a hero well coming from sarah hansen young what does one expect i actually have a lot more things in my life to occupy my space than that woman's name i've got a lot more productive things to do than think about her she's an embarrassment in that parliament the fact that she sits in there tragically it actually it says a lot about the electors of that state of South Australia to have somebody like her. But I mean, she actually stands with the people who hate us. She stands with people who hate us. I mean, what does it tell you about her? What does it tell you about the Greens at the party? I mean, they are, the en they are literally the enemies of this nation. I mean, the policies that they advocate. I mean, we, we can't even fix the drought in this nation because of the backward policies they have in place. We can't even build a dam in this country because they're so, so protective of the trees without, they can't see the bigger picture. But coming back to, uh, to what happened there with, with the egg boy and Fraser and the media, the media was so hostile to him. And you know, the, the most disappointing part of it was that even the conservative media, if I can call it the conservative media, that even Sky would not give him, an, give him a hearing. Not even Sky would talk to him or give him, a, give him an opportunity to talk about the policies he advocates. And so you got to wonder what's, what's going on here. And all that he was doing was only standing up for the future of this country. So you didn't see his statement post Christchurch as, as victim blaming as it was interpreted. And then there was, of course, the, the, the motion in Parliament to, to censure him. The Greens, they wanted him suspended, but uh, the politicians realised that would be setting a, a, a dangerous precedent. You thought his statements post Christchurch were appropriate? But the rank hypocrisy of those people in Parliament to talk about. Not even a week later, nearly 300 Christians were killed by Muslims in the name of their God in Sri Lanka. Did any one of them come out and condemn the Muslims for their behavior? Well, they just said we condemn attacks on people of faith and Easter worshippers, that's what. That's not good enough. Now, the Easter worshippers, I think that came from, from, from Crooked Hillary and, and Obama. Yeah. But I'm talking about our parliament and our leaders who condemned Fraser Anning. Did any of them come out and strongly condemn 300 people that is six times the number of people that were killed in, in Christchurch not even a week later six times the number of people did any of them come out and condemn the Islamic community and this the 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 ideology of Islam for what happened now I don't condone what the guy did in Christchurch I don't condone any any life being taken 
It was despicable. The act was totally despicable. But he didn't do it in the name of any ideology. He did it in the name of, uh, I've read a bit of his manuscripts and the things and what led him to do it. But the guys who did it, in, who did it in, in Sri Lanka did it in the name of Allah. Was the condemnation of the same effect from any of our parliamentarians? Why is it when a Christian is killed, they turn the other way? But when a Muslim is, all of a sudden, they, they stand on the, ground, on the side of the Muslim and take the, take the high moral ground. But this, to me, is not duplicity. This is cowardice. These people are cowards. And the, 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 tragedy, of it, the tragedy of it all is this. The Muslim community knows that these people are cowards and they play on it. They actually know that these people are cowards. They haven't got the courage to deal with them. The only two countries as such that know how to deal with the Islamic community is Israel, of course, and Sri Lanka and, and Singapore. And of course, the Muslims know how to deal with their own brothers, as we know what goes on in the Arab world. You get caught behaving the way these guys do. They have no, they give them the bullet or the sword around the neck or the rope. Uh, there definitely seems to be more uh, political reaction to what happened in Christchurch than what happened in uh, Sri Lanka, where uh, Jacinda Ardern, she's still talking about cracking down on, on hate speech on social media, but is anyone talking about uh, Sri Lanka anymore? No, yeah. I can understand why people are not talking about it. As you saw from that little episode that took place out of Jackie Trad's office, when you had that goon come up there and abuse Fraser Anning. And I, got, and I got into his face and I asked him, where was he when 300 Sri Lankans were killed? Where were you, you, you coward? Where were all these people? Where were the Greens? I mean, when it comes to being cowards, these blokes would take the biscuit. These blokes would be running away with Oscars when it comes to it, being cowards. They cannot even come to mention and talk about it. And I can understand why the media won't, qu won't question them on it. Why the mainstream media is silent. They are part of the problem. Now, as we've established, you were embraced uh, by Fraser Anning and the, uh, the the party to be his number two candidate in, in Queensland. But actual white nationalists and alt writers, they did not approve of your candidacy. There was a article that appeared on XYZ, which is another uh, right wing uh, website that because you were selected as a candidate, Fraser Anning was not the messiah that uh, we've been looking for. And the the argument was that they believed that you could not be trusted if elected to defend traditional Australia given your immigrant background. So suppose you were elected to the, the Senate hypothetically, what would be the issues you sought to highlight in, in the Senate? I would put into place a proposal as to how we could very clinically restrict Muslim immigration to the country. Now, I would not say stop Muslim immigration. I wouldn't put, a, put forward a proposal to stop Muslim immigration. I'd put forward something like this. When people migrate or look to migrate to this country, or even refugees want to come in here, I have a form that they first need to, to look at and answer, this, answer those questions on the form before they proceed to application stage. And the questions would go in this format. Do you have an issue with the Australian flag? Do you have an issue with the Australian anthem? Do you have an issue with our Anzac Day? Do you have an issue with our Judean Christian laws? Do you have an issue with, uh, with pork being sold in our supermarkets and on barbecues and open public spaces? Do you have a problem with people having dogs as pets or piglets as pets? Do you have a problem with the way our women dress at the beach or even at home? Do you have any difficulty with your children wanting to convert out their religion? And they can choose any religion they want to do and you can't do anything about it? Do you have any difficulty with uh, that you can't force your children into marriage? That they have rights and they are protected under Australian laws? Now if people have difficulties with this and they say yes they have problems with it, well then you, you can't come to Australia. And that would apply to, to Indians, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, wherever you come from, Muslims, Jews, if you've got issues with any of these things, we very clinically remove people from coming to this country. And if you come here and you don't have issues with any of these things, and if when you're in here, then you turn around and you have problems with it, we've then got the grounds to remove you from the country. All I'm looking for is we want people who will come in here and assimilate. If you find everything that we've got in this great country, if you find anything here offensive, 
then don't come here. That's all. We want you to come here if you want to come here. We want you to celebrate what this country's got to offer. Participate in it. And contribute to it. If those are difficult areas for you, you're in the wrong country. In our major cities, there's nothing worse than we've got these ghettos that exist, especially in, in Sydney, where you've got l large amounts of, of suburbs in the, in the West, which are basically Islamic. And, and that's we, we need to re-embrace the word assimilation because that, that's what you're supposed to do when you immigrate to a country. And there are a lot of people talk, how can you sort of monitor screen people if they're if they're coming in uh, like you like you said with the with these questions and that but if if somebody migrates to australia and they then uh advocating for aspects of of sharia law then i think that's a pretty uh, good indication that they're not integrating absolutely i mean if sharia law was so great why did you come here i mean if everything you had in the country you came from was so good why did you come here mm, exactly you know, that's why I totally endorse what Trump just said to those four people in America. You know, go back. Go back to where you came from. If you don't like it here, why did you come here? I'm aware of what's happening in, in, in Sydney. In fact, may go back many years ago, David Jull, who was then the member for Fadden, when I had a meeting with him, this was in 19, about 1992, I had a meeting with him in his office. And I asked him, I said, is John Howard aware of what's going on here? with Islam and his response to me was he said yes very aware of it we could literally circle off Lakemba and that part of Sydney as just a totally different nation you didn't have to wait for that to happen we had knowledge of what was happening around the world why didn't we have the courage to stand up to protect the country that's what I can't get over the decades of consistent weak leadership looking the other way and unfortunately it appears that we've still got it right now they haven't got the courage to stand up and correct what's going wrong in this country yeah, you're right. There's been plenty of years to, to act and, and change policy. Now, as it's quite clear throughout this interview, Islam is the, the, the main issue of concern for you for the future of Australia. But uh, as we've seen in Melbourne these previous two summers, there's been Sudanese uh, crime gangs that have been uh, rampaging uh, through particular suburbs. Now, that was uh, when Fraser Anning uh, travelled down to attend the, the anti-crime rally in St Kilda in Melbourne in January. That was when the, the mainstream media, they first uh, turned on him. Uh, you agree that this is another aspect of our immigration program that's, that needs addressing because uh, Fraser Anning, he also incorporated uh, immigration from, from that part of the world into his policy. I totally agree with Fraser on that. And I can guarantee you, those people that have come into the country did not come in here as skilled migrants. So who dumped them in our country? I've spoken to the, to the odd liberal guy and I said, you want to, get the, you want to fill the country with, with immigrants? You want to fill up the population? You want to increase the population? I'll show you how to do it. So we can bring in the best and the best in the world to come into this country who want to migrate over here. Skilled migrants are people who will contribute, assimilate and integrate into this nation. Why are we bringing these people who cannot, who bring no skills with them apart from what is on display at the moment? Who the hell is dumping these people on us? No one has the courage to tell me who it is. We, only have, we can only deduce that this is a UN agenda. What have these parliamentarians been doing all these years in Parliament? I mean, don't they know it's a danger? Don't they know it? they don't assimilate? Look at the crime that's taking place. Look at the direct effect on our economy, the direct effect on unemployment benefits that go out, increase in, crime, increase in policing these people. I mean, we're putting our funds in the wrong direction. Rather than using our funds to look after our, our veterans, our pensioners, and building infrastructure, we're spending billions of dollars on security and trying to protect the people who live in this country from the people we've brought in who cannot assimilate. I mean, which part of stupid don't these people get? Yeah, it was insane last summer in Melbourne where the, uh, basically the police had to patrol all the, the major beaches, which is, is quite uh, alarming that well, during Australian summers, it's a natural thing to go to the beach that we, we basically need them to have security 
all all the time and it's not just confined to to melbourne now these uh, sudanese crime it's also spread to, to sydney with a lot of uh walk and grabs in in stores in in sydney and there's even been instances in in brisbane as well so it's not just a, a melbourne problem anymore do you know why it's spreading i can think like these people and the reason it's spreading is because they know that the laws we have in place are so ineffectual and they know that we have brought them in here so we can't really just turn them around now. I mean, I just wish someone would actually tell us. I wish the mainstream media would ask the question, why have we brought in these people who cannot assimilate? I mean, they definitely haven't come in on a skilled migration visa. So why are we bringing in people who are going to be a burden on our economy? I mean, if you ran a business the way these people run the immigration policy, the banks would have closed in on us. Yeah, you're right. It's never been answered and it's all been when, when they're asked about immigration it's all been you know hot air like oh we'll we'll look at this so uh, we we definitely want to uh make sure that well they, they always talk about stopping the boats but there's all these people coming by plane and other means the these people who've come in for in who the gangs in in victoria they were just dumped on us who brought them into the country who let them into the country you know i would like you to ask the leaders of the day Ask them, how did these people get into the country? Under what program did they come into the country? What were the criteria used to bring them in here? Now, I've got Nigerian customers, Sudanese customers as well, and even they have said, why are we bringing in the very people who kill us in the country we fled from? Why are we bringing in Sudanese Muslims and Nigerian Muslims who are killing Christians in Sudan and Nigeria? Why are we bringing them into this country to carry on the same war front? What does it take for these guys to get it? The answer always seems we've got to maintain a non-discriminatory immigration policy, which, well, as we've spoken about, it seems just non-discriminatory means just letting anybody in. But when it comes down to it, uh, we can't have any immigration policy which is seen to be racist or not an internationalist approach. We just reverse to a policy of assimilation. That's not racist. To want to protect your own culture, your own heritage, and your own people is what a patriot would do. It's a fool who would go the other way and a coward. Why would you want to threaten the future of your own children to people who would come and who openly tell you what their agenda is? I mean, to lock your doors at night, when you go to bed at night, do you lock your doors? Yes. You lock your doors at night not because you hate the people outside, you do it because you love the people inside. So why don't we why don't we we do the same thing to the country yeah good point now obviously the phrase reigning is conservative nationals they're most known for their approach to immigration but there were many other policies in the the, the party platform especially to address the the high cost of living we have in australia i mean electricity prices continue to rise petrol uh, food uh, f our agriculture has been crippled by many uh, green policies there's there's so much to to fix uh, in that regard as well oh tim uh, you, you're spot on you go back in 2004 i was one of those very optimistic about malcolm turnbull when he first entered parliament and John Howard's first position that he gave him in cabinet was as Minister for Water and the Environment. And Malcolm Turnbull uh, went out and had a study conducted. At a cost of $60 million, he came up with a blueprint to drought-proof the nation. I vividly recall that in that interview when he, when he announced this program to drought-proof the country, to catch the rainwater, 80% of our rainwater in the north of Queensland washes out to the ocean. But to capture that water, build dams and channel across and drought proof the nation and make us the food bowl to Asia. Right now, our farmers are the beggars. Okay, we know that Howard went on to lose that election. My question goes before that. What did we do with the billions of dollars that came from the mining boom? What serious infrastructure did the Howard government put in place? Nothing. I mean, this is where I often call it the mismanagement of this great economy, this great nation. Uh, I came to the country in 1985. From 85 to now, in my opinion, there have been just three significant infrastructure projects that have taken place. One was the floating of the Australian dollar, and Bob Hawke was in Prime Minister and Keith was Treasurer. 
If we try to do that today, there's no hope of it getting through. This is how toxic the political environment now is. But that's what happened. The floating of the Australian dollar, the award wage accord, again the, Howard, the Hawke government, and then John Howard brought in the GST. Outside of that, there's no significant infrastructure that has taken place. I mean, these guys have taken decades to even construct a second air, international airport in Sydney. I mean, what did we do with the billions of dollars that came in from the mining boom? People often talk about, I often hear Howard talk about his legacy being that he left the country debt-free, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, even a resident Galar could have done what Howard did because the billions that came in from the mining revenue, there was no, uh, there was no actual business acumen required to do that. So much of money was coming from the mining from the mining boom. They sold Telstra to pay off the little debt that we had in the country. But what did they do with the rest of the money that came in? Why didn't they, rather than giving it back as taxpayer, you know, as tax re, as uh, tax cuts to the, to the nation? Why didn't they invest it in building the infrastructure to drought-proof the country? Could you imagine the ripple effect that would have had on the nation and the economy? Our farmers would no longer be on their knees. The farms have been up and running, thriving businesses. They would have had to start employing a lot more people. In employing people in the bush, those bush towns would have come alive. More employment would have been created rather than them being deserted. I can't believe the foolish, short-sighted policies that took place. Look at the state of our farms today. Why are we in drought when so much of our rainwater is being washed out? Why was this infrastructure not put in? We talk about electricity <coughs> prices. I mean, France, as you may know, is a net exporter of energy to, the, to a few Euro European nations, to a few of its neighbours. 74% of France's energy comes from nuclear. You know, we talk about the where energy comes from. The cleanest is solar or wind, and we know it's a joke. It's never ever going to give us baseload power. Well, not wind even Bob Brown energy. likes wind power now. Yep. So the next best is hydro energy. We could have done that with the dams. The next best is nuclear energy. And the technology that's come on scale for nuclear energy is so significant. I mean, you take the, if I were to give you an analogy, take a, a US powered submarine, the, the, the latest, the, the Gerald Ford submarine, uh, the Gerald Ford aircraft carrier. It goes for 50 years. It's got two nuclear reactors and it only needs to be refueled after 20 years. That's on a nuclear powered ship. That's the state of technology today. We've got the greatest, we've got some of the best uranium in the world. We export it around the world, but we've not had the leadership in this country to actually convince the electorate the significant advantages of having nuclear energy and its zero emissions. Yeah, there's been so many options for us. And I remember the, the first drought in or two, 2007, and we've had so many more droughts since then. It's been blamed on, on climate change, but if we haven't constructed uh, new dams for for many decades and going back to what you mentioned on on infrastructure it's it's only now that state governments are catching up sydney at the moment is a construction zone the same thing is happening uh, here in melbourne at the moment where uh, they, they seem to be finally getting the message well if you want all these immigrants to, to come in you've got to build the the infrastructure and the services to to keep up you know why are we chasing our tail on this why aren't we being proactive? Why, are we, why don't we have the vision to see in front, to see ahead of us and plan ahead and act on it? This is why I often, when I speak at various events, I call it the financial vandalism of this country. The money that we had, we could have rescued the nation for, with, the, with the dams. We could have built hydroelectric plants, hydro energy plants along the way. We could have done these things, but instead we did nothing. John Howard was a safe pair of hands, but if you actually do you look at it very very clinically as to what was actually accomplished in those 11 years with the amount of money that came through, it's a failed result. A lot of it's to do with politics. Uh, when a new state government comes in, they cancel the, the opponent's projects and then sit on what they're, what they're going to do and have feasibility studies or, or whatever. And then federal state relations, there's, there's got to be a commitment from, from both the federal and state government to get a project up. They, they don't agree on what the, the right project is. I see this in Victoria, uh, 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 myself over the, over the past, uh, four years, there's, there, there's just so much political 
games going on and then pandering to special interest groups. That's why a decision can never be made. Did we hear at any time in 11 years of the Howard government and then after, well, the, the wasted years of this nation, of course, was, was the Rudd Gillard government. Total joke, total waste. But between that uh, and the time when we had stable government under John Howard, these things were never talked about. We can't blame the state governments for it. While we are very conscious of the relationship state, state and federal government, but there was a time when, there we had, when we had liberal governments across the nation. Across the state, we had liberal governments, state governments, and we had a federal, federal liberal government as well. It was a great opportunity to do it, but nothing was done. No, as we've established, there's been so many wasted years which we're only paying catch up now. Now, obviously, there was, despite the media and political hostility to Fraser Anning's Conservative National Party, uh, his personal Facebook page managed to get over uh, 120,000 followers. You easily, in the in the first day, we're able to get over the, the 500 members, which is required for uh, federal uh, registration. Uh, there, there was a lot of uh, initial support, but uh, in the, the federal election, overall, the, the party only got 0.64% uh, of the the, the Senate vote, and it was a case of 2016 over again, uh, Nationalists and Patriots, they still voted for Pauline Hanson's One Nation. We saw Malcolm Roberts uh, return to the, the Senate in Queensland, and uh, Fraser Anning obviously has now departed. So there's a bit of time before the next election in 2022, which it will probably uh, be in. Will the party uh, continue? Can it build more solid uh, foundations in the next electoral cycle in the hope of increasing its vote at the, the next election? That's precisely what I'm doing right now as the leader of the party. And I can assure you, you know, what happened at the last federal election, as you know, we only had 10 days before the federal election to get, get with the party being registered to get all these candidates in place. There was hardly any time for the candidates to campaign. Uh, I put it this way, the party was ambushed at every corner. And to get those candidates in place and to do what they could do in such a short time frame was an excellent result. We had no media avatar, we had no media exposure whatsoever. And Fraser got nothing. If even if the conservative media had the courage to give him some exposure we would have had a significantly better result. And there's something else too, which is a bit of a concern, but very disturbed by it. I'll give an example, taken in the seat of Toowoomba, the candidate who stood there. When people were voting for, for Fraser Anning's party, they were not voting really for the candidate in the lower house, they were voting for Fraser Anning. So we just take the candidate in Toowoomba. As an example, let's, let's give you a hypothetical. He got about say 3000 votes in the lower house. So he was never gonna win his seat. But the votes for Fraser in the Senate was only half that of what the guy got in the lower house. And we find that quite remarkable, that people would go in to vote for Fraser. But in the upper house, he only got 50% of the vote. I've heard some of these theories about anomalities in the, the, the voting uh, for Fraser Anning's party, but I, I just see no substantial evidence to to back that up and there's always more candidates to vote for in the in the Senate than there is in the lower house. But when someone goes and I, I can recall when I stood for One Nation, people would take the card from me and say, mate, that's the one we're voting for. And when I was handing out how to vote cards for Fraser Anning, people took the card from me and said, yep, that's the guy we're voting for. That's the man. When you're voting for a Patriot Party, people are committed and they know exactly where they're going with their vote. Even if I extrapolated the figures and added some more to it, he was never ever going to get over the line. But we'll, we'll watch it the next time around. We, we've got time on our hands, we've got the time to prepare, and that's precisely what we're doing right now. We're doing the groundwork, we're preparing the party and getting ready for the next federal election. And we'll have all bases covered. Well, if you're worried about that sort of thing happening, then there's room next election to have scrutineers uh, oversee the, the vote. There's plenty of, pl plenty of options there for, for you to make sure that 
the integrity of the vote is protected. Uh, precisely. That's precisely what I say to the say to the candidates and the members. Time is now on our side, and we've now got the time to get it right. Despite the fact that there was only a short time to select uh, candidates, and uh, it included 29 of the 30 Queensland uh, seats, and of course the, the mainstream media, they, they were drooling over whether they could destroy a, a Fraser Anning Conservative National Party uh, candidate, but there were no major candidate scandals throughout throughout the election and they, they reported on you know, some of the views that they had on Islam and other issues but that's only a problem for the uh, the mainstream but as we saw during the election it was the mainstream uh, party's candidates they were the ones who are getting into uh, trouble so that wasn't really a problem for uh, the party during the campaign well and it, it's it is highly commendable on the candidates and given the, the very limited time we had to pull the whole thing together and as to how well they performed and it's, it's rightly so the way the way things panned out for us but we've got time on our side next time now as we mentioned your former party rise up has uh, deregistered and so is the australian conservatives uh, party and a lot of the rationale is that, well, Scott Morrison is a good conservative Christian leader. He'll do the, the right thing uh, by us, which I think personally that's uh, wishful thinking. I sincerely hope, I genuinely hope for the future of the nation and for freedom of speech and freedom of religion that Scott would rise to the would rise to the platform, rise up to the, and deliver. Okay, he's been given an excellent opportunity to correct and set in place laws which would be more friendly and which would be right for freedom of speech and freedom of religion. If he does that, I think he would, he's got an excellent opportunity to actually, now I won't say that because, <laughs> uh, but he's, he's been given an excellent opportunity and I do believe the very hand of God intervened and he's been given an excellent opportunity to correct the freedom of religion and freedom of speech laws in this country. I sincerely and genuinely hope, genuinely hope that he rises to the occasion. The main concern for me is that, especially after post-Christchurch, he's remade himself as a Prime Minister for all religion. He seems to believe now that all religions are equal when he talks about religious freedom. He He's not referencing Christianity, he's talking about all the, the different others. It that, that seems to be there's a bit of relativism that's crept into his rhetoric about around religion. Well. Being the, being the country we are and the laws we have, all we want from him is to correct the laws to protect freedom of speech and freedom of religion. You know, I want to have the freedom to say that, uh, just, this is just off the cuff, okay? I want to have the freedom to say that uh, this so and so televangelist is a charlatan. I also want to have the freedom and to be protected by the laws to say, that Islam is the most evil ideology known to humanity. Now we do know that people say a lot of things about Jesus Christ, but they never get prosecuted for it. We do know that the LGBTI and their agenda, they say things about, about us, but they never get brought to, brought to account for their behavior. Bernard Gaynor is a classic example of what the guy's been going through for the last few years. And it's the, the tragedy of it is it's the laws that these actual states have put in to protect the people we're actually attacking our freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Okay, those are state laws, but then we cannot expect the federal government to sit by and do nothing. Now, Scott has been given this opportunity to correct this. And if he does not, then I can assure you that the churches will judge him harshly. And that will flow out in votes. Well, we've got in Victoria the Racial and Religious uh, Tolerance Act, which it was, it was first used on your former party leader, Danny Nalia. He had to go through the courts for, for many years and eventually it was, was overturned. But that was such a, uh, a grueling 
process for basically stating what what his interpretation of Islam was, and we've got at the uh, uh, currently um, Blair Cottrell appealing his uh, conviction for the the mock beheading during the the Bendigo mosques uh, protest. So you're exactly right that these, even though it's called the uh, Religious Vilification Act, that it's it seems to be only protecting Islam. I, I can't get over the stupidity of it. I, I just can't get over it. And when Danny Nalai was brought into court on that, on that matter, the authority for everything that Danny did and said was the Quran. And when I speak, I have no authority to speak on Islam except what the Quran says. I quote Erdogan, who is the international representative head for the Islamic community in the world. I mean, I'm not an authority of the subject. Erdogan is an authority. When he says he finds it ugly and offensive when people say that, when people use the term moderate Islam, I mean, I respect this guy. I better take note of when this guy talks because he's a man of substance, a man of authority on the subject. So when people, you have other imams and so uh, these people from the Islamic community say that you know, they are going to kill the kill people once, once they get 51% of the population, once 50% of the vote, and if we don't believe, we don't convert, we have to, you know, they'll kick us out of here. I mean, I'm not making it up. This is what the guy is saying. How can you vilify me for it? When he said, why didn't you go into villa? Why didn't you bring him to account? I mean, anything we quote from the Quran is what the Quran itself actually says. If you don't like me quoting from the Quran, well, then you need to get rid of the Quran. Well, they don't like people quoting the Bible anymore either. Well, if you don't like people quoting the Bible, then why do we use it in, in courts? And why do we swear people in, into parliament and it judges into the high courts, etc., with their hand on the Bible? When our laws in this land are built on the Bible. A lot of strange things happening currently. I, and of course, I referenced the, the Israel Falau uh, saga, which is yeah yet to play out. That's a spectacular example, and that would be really interesting to see how that goes, because you can't really dictate and tell somebody that you can't you can't advocate what you what you believe in a church setting. How can you tell somebody that? Supposing they have a Muslim in there in the rugby, whatever this get this game is they play rugby, and out there he's he's in his mosque, bowing down and believing with everything that's being advocated from there to kill the non-believer. Will they have the courage to tell that Muslim guy, no, you can't do that now, you, they're going to tear his contract up? I guarantee you they wouldn't have the courage to do it. I guarantee you they wouldn't have the courage to do it. That uh, would be an interesting different circumstance. Well, uh, Paul, I've appreciated you uh, coming on the show today give, to give us an update on the Fraser Anning Conservative Nationals Party, because like I said, there was a lot of momentum uh, during the election, but things have been or uh, very quiet uh, post-election. Uh, good luck with uh, the strategy uh, going forward, and yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see uh, where the party can can go from here. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure. And that's the show for today. I've got more new guests lined up, so stay tuned for those in future episodes. Remember to check out Detonation by my colleague Steel Archer, featured on the Unshackled's YouTube channel, which is continuing to produce regular and engaging shows. Don't forget, The Uncuckables is on again this Thursday at 8.30pm Melbourne time. Make sure you've subscribed to the YouTube channel so you're notified when the show goes live. You would already be aware that you can't depend on Facebook to keep you informed. You can also strike Google from that list as well with its fake news search results and Wikipedia with its fake knowledge. It's time that all of us made the effort to stay out of the information manipulation cycle. Use DuckDuckGo for your search results and InfoGalactic for your information needs. Free speech social media is also a place that doesn't engage in algorithmic manipulations and The Unshackled has a presence on all of these platforms. We're on gab.com slash The Unshackled. We're also on minds.com slash The underscore Unshackled. And we also have a page at mewe dot com slash p slash the unshackled and of course we are on the growing telegram encrypted messaging app with our own channel at t.me slash the unshackled remember 
that we cannot produce the, the content that we do without your support and the best method of supporting our work and to make sure that we can reach as many people as possible is to support us financially. We're on patreon.com slash the unshackled and paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have a premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. We are also on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and I'll see you very soon for the next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.